Welcome Adam's followers and heathens alike to this week's sermon where we take a look at the good, the bad, and the ugly concept art from Fallout 3. This will be subjective, and if you disagree with my take, then I have a mini nuke for you to catch. But there really are interesting insights into Fallout 3 and Fallout 4 and I discuss some of the lore implications with some of the ideas. So crank up the rads as we go through the most interesting of all Fallout 3's concept art. John Henry Eden, the president of the Enclave in Fallout 3, whose voice we hear through the iBots that are roaming the capital wasteland, is kind of underwhelming looking when finally confronted in game. Of course, part of the twist is that he is an artificial intelligence rather than a person, but the interface itself is absolutely nothing special. Being just an oscilloscope type screen that displays waveforms whenever he speaks. That is really it, except for these flowers, but I bet they're fake too, just like the fake President Eden, leading the fake continuation of the American government. What makes how Eden is portrayed in game all the more disappointing is when you see his awesome concept art, a towering screen filled with a figure in a suit that dominates the scene. This is Eden, and he is able to project his image even farther with smaller screens that show a close-up of his face. The interior of Raven Rock looks absolutely enormous, and that is a constant theme with a lot of this concept art. The concept art is always far more spacious than what we see in game, and that's just a consequence of scaling things in game to be more performant. So I'm not going to focus on that aspect at all. This is a much more impressive portrayal of Eden, and reminds me of The Wizard of Oz, which I think is kind of appropriate given Eden's role as the man behind the curtain at Raven Rock. Even if the size of the screen had to be more conservative, like the size of Mr. House's display when interacting with the player at the Lucky 38, it would have been a vastly better portrayal. Seeing something on the screen other than a wavy little line would have been so much more engaging and interesting as well really selling the idea that Eden is trying to bridge the gap between man and machine. Eden's personality is an amalgamation of several different presidents, and it would have been great if this digital portrayal was also a mixture of several different presidents, just to really drive that point home. If the meeting with Eden was even a fraction of what we see here in this concept art, it would have been much more impressive and memorable. How can you not like a 100-foot robot that shoots lasers from its face, throws small nuclear bombs like footballs, and spouts pre-war propaganda? Well, if you're the Enclave or the Institute, I can understand why you wouldn't, because Liberty Prime is an absolute force of nature. I quite like the version of Liberty Prime that we get in Fallout 3 and Fallout 4. Prime looks intimidating, weighty, and a purpose-built robot of war. Given Prime's importance, it is no surprise that the Fallout 3's concept artist, Adam Adamowicz, played a lot with Prime's design and experimented with a number of ideas before settling on what we see in-game. Some of these are not that great. Like this is just not doing it for me. He looks like an upscaled Protectron. Other versions replace Prime's hands with a myriad of cannons, guns, and even a shield. The number of absurd weapons built into Prime's arms in some of these versions make me think of the Iron Giant when he's in his battle mode, and the circular shield seems a bit reminiscent of Captain America. I kind of take issue with the shield, however, because Prime seems like an assault weapon through and through, and having a large defensive shield seems antithetical to his offensive purposes. I find some of the notes on the art interesting, like the one that says that there should not be symmetry. That was something that definitely did not survive into the real version. Many of these concepts also have a human for scale. Prime is often shown as being much smaller than he actually ended up being. I prefer the design and size of Liberty Prime in the games, but I would be interested to hear how many of you like the more mech warrior designs. We've looked at a concept that was good, one that was ugly, but how about one that is just bad? 
Wanamingos were first portrayed in Fallout 2, but were also pretty clearly meant to die off as a species after the events of Fallout 2. Maybe that has something to do with me kicking them in the groin socket across the screen. It is interesting then that Fallout 3 had some concept art for Wanamingos, and they are some chonky boys. I don't know what the scale is for these guys, but they seem huge, dragging their giant sagging bodies on the ground. I don't really know how they would move with much speed at all, and with this x-ray look inside one of these, the bones look comically large. Just look at that skull. I love how the one note that we can see specifically floats the idea of Wanamingos leaving behind giant dung heaps that the player could loot ammo and resources from. So apparently, these things would have just been roving scavengers that scooped up anything and everything. Although I think Wanamingos are interesting in Fallout 2, I am glad they didn't move forward with implementing them in Fallout 3. Now this is an interesting one because the Cryolator, with a K, was first conceived in the Fallout 3 design process, but it wouldn't be implemented in-game until Fallout 4. However, I think the concept that we see in Fallout 3 looks far superior to what we got in Fallout 4. Fallout 4's design is rather forgettable. Nothing about the design inherently gives me the impression that this weapon is going to shoot freezing ammunition or freeze enemies. Fallout 3's Cryolator concept, though, is a whole different story, and it is mainly due to that large, iced-over radiator. How that would actually function, I don't really know, but just looking at the weapon makes it clear what it does. The one thing I'm not really sold on is the backpack component, but that was something that was normal with a number of weapons like the Shish Kebab in Fallout 3, and even though it is probably more realistic to have a big tank of liquid nitrogen or whatever, I would rather see everything integrated into one unit, like with the Fallout 4 Cryolator. Be honest with yourself though, this version is way cooler than what we get in Fallout 4 76. Okay, this one will require a little bit of explaining on my part, because on the one hand, I love this idea and design, but on the other hand, I don't necessarily think it fits in completely with Fallout 3's aesthetic. Fallout 3 has several instances where virtual reality pods can be encountered, as part of the Operation Anchorage DLC, and part of the main quest in Vault 112. In game we see them as large, egg-shaped enclosed loungers, where one sits on a chair inside, and a TV screen displays the virtual world that the person becomes immersed in. I always found this a little bit weird. It looks like people are just sitting in these loungers, like they just sat down to watch some late night TV, with no medical or life support systems attached. Peering inside the loungers, you can see that people seem to be sitting upright and staring intently at the screen, but the concept art for these loungers shows something very different. I freaking love these designs. The virtual reality system completely encapsulates the person's head, making the users of the lounger look more like a slave to the virtual reality system than the in-game loungers do. And that is exactly what these people are. They are slaves to Dr. Brown. Now I said I love these designs, but I don't think they fit Fallout 3's aesthetic very well. But lucky for us, there are some other lounger concepts. And in between of the face-sucking concept that we saw, and the lounge chair and TV screen we get in Fallout 3, is this concept. A large helmet that goes over most of the user's head also has a large TV screen over their face that I presume would be visible on both the inside and the outside of the helmet, letting someone on the outside see what the user is looking at or experiencing. They are certainly quite creepy, but also visually interesting and more in line with the general Fallout 3 aesthetic than the face suckers that I think are so cool. Additionally, an important discovery in Vault 112 is that the Lone Wanderer's father, James, is stuck in the simulation, and the lounger that he is sitting in is artificially darkened so that it's really hard to see that it's actually him. These other two designs that cover all or most of the face would have hidden James inherently through their design, so not only do they make more sense in fooling a person's senses, 
look a lot cooler and more interesting than what we see in game, but they also would have easily concealed James' face, rather than doing something hokey like making only James's lounger hard to see into. Alright, how about some more concepts that I'm glad did not make it into the final game? Mr. Handy Robots have been a part of Fallout since the very first game, and although their look has changed from the earliest games, they are still overall recognizable, mostly due to the large spherical body and the arms. That makes the Mr. Handy concept art all the stranger, because a lot of them would have looked very different, only sharing the multiple arms that each terminate in a different utility tool. These just don't hit the same, and some of them don't even look like they are levitating like the original Mr. Handys either. Mr. Handys are one of the most personable robots in all the series, where Protectrons just seem a little too rudimentary and stupid, and Robobrains are really creepy. Mr. Handys land in that sweet spot where they seem like they are more of a person than any other robot, and in the case of companions like Codsworth and Curie in Fallout 4, they are their own people. None of these designs come off as charming and aren't as recognizable as the one we ended up with in-game, so I am glad they look the way they do. The Power Fist is an iconic Fallout weapon that has been with us since the earliest games, although it has gone through a lot of design changes throughout the years. While I don't dislike the Power Fist that we get in Fallout 3, this concept I think really sells the idea of a Power Fist. It is quite literally just one giant piston, and the whole contraption fits over the hand and all of the forearm as well. If we are thinking in terms of utility, the version we see in Fallout 3 makes more sense since the user would still have decent use of their hand, being able to grasp things with their fingers. But the huge round piston, the sheer bulk, and frankly, the absurd scale of this Power Fist concept, I think is more in line with the spirit of what a Power Fist is. It is not a weapon that compromises. It's not built with much more in mind than inflicting as much damage as possible to a target, and I think this concept conveys that message better than anything else. Rats, pig rats, and mole rats are creatures that we have seen since the earliest games, and they have always been pretty... eh. They are low-level creatures that aren't all that interesting to look at or to fight, but there was a concept to make them a lot more intimidating. This image shows a slaver that has tamed a giant naked mole rat as he drags a slave, probably towards Paradise Falls, where he can sell them off and make some caps. This mole rat is huge. It would have been the size of at least two Brahmin, probably more, and would have been a super nasty surprise to find either roaming free in the wasteland or in a violent confrontation with a slaver. I like the idea of rarer versions of creatures that are vastly bigger or more dangerous than their more common variants, like a super mutant compared to a super mutant behemoth. The fat man hardly requires an introduction, but before it was an admittedly pretty ridiculous, pneumatically powered mini nuke thrower, there was an even more absurd concept. Crazy, I know. It is so bonkers, it wraps back around from being awful to being hilarious. At some point, the fat man was envisioned as being a mini runway that would use a small conveyor belt to help get the mini nuke off the launcher, at which point a small rocket that was shaped exactly like a B-29 bomber would engage and propel the mini nuke a distance before the rocket ran out of fuel and dropping the mini nuke which emulates a bomber dropping off its payload. The concept art even specifies that the model plane rocket thing was to actually be a scale replica of the Enola Gay, which was the B-29 that dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. The atomic bomb named Fat Man. This is honestly so absurd that I kind of wish there would have been a unique version of the Fat Man that looked and operated just like this but I also understand why they opted for the version we see in-game. Paradise Falls, the main base of operations for the rather extensive and influential slavers within the Capital Wasteland, is a unique place for many reasons, but one of the more memorable parts of Paradise Falls is a giant statue of a young man holding an ice cream. 
This is little more than a curiosity and a landmark in Fallout 3, but the concept art shows there was an idea to make it more consequential. I like the idea presented in the art. The man would have been holding a hamburger, and there would have been a way for NPCs, and most likely the player, to make their way up to the burger. It was to be used as a watchtower and a bunker, a burger bunker, and I think it would have been a creative use of the large statue. It also would have been a point of irony, having slavers armed to the teeth, keeping slaves from escaping up in a hamburger held by a happy smiling man. This also reminds me of the dinosaur that is used as a watch outpost in New Vegas's Novak settlement, and I wish this memorable landmark would have been more than just an interesting thing to look at. Now this next one is pretty interesting and I have mixed feelings regarding the intended implementation in Fallout 3. These concept images show an interesting specimen, namely a man who is partially turned into a super mutant with some IVs no doubt filled with some sort of medicine that is keeping one half of his body from finishing that transformation. This half man, half super mutant was actually meant to be James, the father of the Lone Wanderer at some point during Fallout 3's development. Now this idea never came to fruition. James would die in his attempt to keep the Enclave from controlling Project Purity and never even came close to becoming a super mutant. How this would have worked within the plot of Fallout 3, I'm a bit unsure. I could see it being interesting if done well, but it would be very easy to mess up and wasting what is otherwise an intriguing idea. The concept of a half-human, half-super mutant is super interesting though, and something I would be happy to see explored in a future game. The alien blaster in Fallout 3 I think is a fun, retro-futuristic ray gun design, and other than being a bit eccentric, it's really not all that wild or unusual of a weapon. It is funny then that the few alien blaster concepts for this game were super funky. One concept would have a live, Xenomatter Neuron that would generate some sort of energy that would be focused into a lethal blast. I have no idea what this neuron is supposed to have come from, it would have been alive, twitching, and suspended in some sort of liquid. While that is kind of bizarre, it has nothing on the other concept. This thing is on another level. It is a super small alien spacecraft that is piloted by a really tiny alien. It has been captured and disabled so that it cannot fly away and the alien cannot leave. And then a pistol grip was fashioned to the ship so it can be held like a pistol. A makeshift electrical system was hooked up to the trigger and upon pulling the trigger, it would have shocked the alien and persuaded him to fire the ship's blasters. I don't even know where to begin with this, but it seems far more at home in a Men in Black movie than in Fallout. The Pit DLC for Fallout 3 is one of my all-time favorites in the Fallout series for a lot of reasons, but the fighting arena known as The Hole is not really one of them. It isn't bad per se, being a relatively simple and small arena that raiders use for entertainment, and the Lone Wanderer has to fight through three rounds as part of the DLC story. A concept of The Hole would not have had it, well, in a hole, and it is called in the art the Ring of Fire. Okay, I'm not too sure about the name, but it would have been an elevated platform that was built over a blast furnace or an exhaust port of some sort, and there is a real possibility of falling off the edge. It would have been interesting if the floor was hot enough to do continual damage to keep the fights fast and furious. I think this sort of fighting arena would have been far more memorable than the hole that we ended up with, even if it is less realistic or practical, but since when has that ever stopped a game like Fallout? There was a load of concept art that was created for the Enclave, and indeed, such an important faction in the Fallout series really deserves a lot of attention. That said, among all the concept art for the Enclave, this one stood out to me. And, uh, well, I think it's pretty clear how the concept artist felt about the Enclave. <laughs> Moving on. The sentry bot that we see in Fallout 3 was a large deviation from the sentry bot that was first seen in Fallout 2, but I like the new design. It looks dangerous, heavily armored, and very intimidating. Indeed, it was the most deadly of all the common robots in game, but this fierce looking robot 
would have not been nearly as menacing if some of this concept art is anything to go by. None of these designs quite do it for me, although there are some that are certainly better than others. I find the most interesting ones to be the two-legged concepts, because I see an early inspiration for the Assaultron in these images. Maybe it's just me, but I see a lot of similarities, particularly in the head and torso, with three articulating fingers, large round ball joints for the arms, a busty torso, and a single port in the head for the sensors, or in the case of the Assaultron, a giant face laser. They seem to differ the most in the legs, where the Assaultron was given feminine proportions that aren't present in the concept art. Aliens have never been an important part of the Fallout series, but they have been consistently present across all the games. When Bethesda planned their Mothership Zeta DLC, they decided to bring aliens from being an easter egg to being full-fledged enemies and a core part of the DLC. As a result, their design needed to be finalized and there were a number of different concepts proposed. The Zetans, as they are called, that we see in-game are not particularly menacing looking, rather conforming to a lot of the stereotypes of the little green men that dominated the science fiction popular culture of the 50s and 60s. The concept art runs the gamut from some of the more conventional looking, if I can use that term, to somewhat menacing, to just kind of sad. This is the worst of the lot, although to be fair at least one of them seems to have been a concept for the abominations that we would see in the DLC, which were experimental creatures with Zayton and human DNA spliced together. It is also interesting to note that a lot of these concepts show an alien in a damaged suit, like it had survived some sort of crash. We don't see that in Fallout 3, but a crashed Zayton craft and beat up Zayton survivor is the main alien encounter in Fallout 4. I do think the alien's portrayal was much better in Fallout 4 than in Fallout 3. But I am really grateful that we didn't get some of these concepts in Mothership Zeta, although if I had to pick a favorite, it would probably be this one. There is a ton of interesting weapon concepts that we can find for Fallout 3, but no other group seems to stand out to me more than the plasma weapons. So many of the examples show weapons with large glass bulbs filled with coils and purple light, and if I were to simply try and guess what kind of damage these would do, having never before seen these drawings or knowing anything about Fallout, I would guess electric or plasma. They seem so evocative of the most notable examples of plasma that we are familiar with. Plasma balls, plasma lamps, neon lights, and one thing that everyone should be familiar with, fluorescent lights. In fact, this picture of a plasma lamp seems to look just like the end of some of these pistol and rifle concepts and really set these weapons apart from anything else, especially contrasting with the blocky laser weapons. I think it is a shame that the plasma weapons we got in game paid the tiniest homage to these concepts because the plasma rifle concept art looks like a futuristic but relatable high-tech weapon that trades its bleeding edge technology for increased fragility and a lack of durability. Plus, purple. That is all. And although there is a ton more concept art, and a lot of it is interesting both in form and from a lore perspective, I'm going to end here. These were the ones that stood out the most to me, and if you would like to look through the art yourself, I have a link in the description where you can browse a lot of it. I would love to hear your thoughts, where you agree or disagree with me, and anything else you think I may have missed. Thank you to my patrons, Adam's devoted followers who go the extra mile to help me produce as much Fallout content as possible for you guys. If you are interested in joining the few and the proud, links are in the description. I will be taking a little extra time for my next video, but the wait should be worth it. Embrace division, Adam's faithful. Take care of yourselves and I will see you soon.